The number five has been a very prominent number in the last five years for me. I'll walk you through why. Um, and I thought when I thought about what I could speak about, this is very, very um, introspective more than anything else. So I'm very, very um, excited if I can to be able to, um, I'm very excited uh, to be able to share with you uh, some of these um, storylines. And I'm really quite keen to be able to walk with you uh, through this storyline. So let me, um, if I can, just move on to this number. If I asked all of you, if I asked all of you to do one thing, think of a number. Think of a number that, apps, that you think about as a number that you, you resonate with. For me, it's this number. I didn't know why this number meant so much, um, but as I've gone through this process of thinking, the number five has shown up in my life more and more and more. So it almost seemed appropriate to use the number five as the five tips that I've learned on myself. And I will use this thematic approach all the way through uh, our discussion today. As it turns out in numerology, the word five itself has something to do with curiosity. In fact, I only learned about this about maybe three weeks ago as I took on uh, the honor of being the 75th president of the uh, Canadian Orthopedic Association. So I was just curious about the numbers. But anyways, five years ago, five years ago, this was what I had called, and I was using this on the slide deck, and, and I presented this slide deck a lot, um, where I would say, okay, if I'm going to be thinking about five things I can be doing uh, to change the way I think about the way I'm going to run my life, personally and professionally, I'm going to use these tools. So I had this little acronym I created, and I said, you know, it's going to be about passion. It's going to be, around, it's going to be about the people that you interact with in your life. And that becomes very important. Um, and it's going to be about the quality of things you do rather than the quantity. Um, I spent the first big chunk of my career publishing a lot. Um, a lot of papers that I now kind of think, I don't think they did much of anything. And I wish I had spent more time on deeper thinking earlier on rather than just putting out lots and lots of papers. So there's lots of opportunities to be able to change and do the things we can. Keep this in mind. And, and I share this with you because I'm sharing with you a true unscripted view of what's happened for me in the last little while. And I'm hoping this will also resonate with you. Well, 16 weeks ago, here I am. I'm with friends in Chihuahua, Mexico, February 20th, and we're walking out and I'm with a colleague who was having um, a book publishing coming out and it was just great. I was just happy and I was excited. And uh, as many of you were probably, think of where you were February 20th and then ask yourself, were you at all concerned about what was happening in the world? I wasn't. I had no idea that we were about to have a full global shutdown. And certainly in my own, pro, uh, in my own country, I, did, I, did, I, I had no idea that I wouldn't be traveling again. I had no idea. I thought I'd be traveling the world. I made all these plans. I was taking over as president of the Canadian Orthopedic Association. And with that, I was going to be traveling around the world. So I knew all this was going to be happening. Um, but then eight weeks ago, Think back, everyone. Eight weeks ago, what happened to us? Eight weeks ago, we were in a full-blown shutdown for most of us. And, oh, and actually, if I could just ask everyone to mute, and Abby, if you could mute everyone, please, that'd be great. Um, so, you know, what I'd like very much to be able to do is walk you through um, this, this situation, right, where, where we're, in a, you know, we're in a productivity paradox. Um, and I asked many of my friends this, many of my colleagues uh, were asked this, you know, this exact very, you know, very exact point, which was, they would say to me, you know, I'm not sure what the future holds right now. And I'm working to distract myself right now because I don't want to think about what's going to happen to me. I don't really want to think about it at all um, because it, 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 it kind of makes me nervous to think. And then here we are. And this is a picture um, from me um, looking uh, in a foggy hillside in Hong Kong, actually. But it's a very apropos of what's been happening over the last eh, eight to 12 weeks. You can't see ahead. In fact, you can't see the future. When people say, what's your three week plan? I don't know. What's your one year plan? Not a clue because you cannot see ahead of you. And in some weird way, as alarming as that feels, and I wonder if many of you feel this or have felt this, it's almost freeing because when you can't see anything, your mind can actually look at an almost nothingness and start reopening and rethinking about other things. But here's the problem we all face. And I feel this is absolutely what happens to many of us in our careers. We get caught up doing so much. We don't have time to stop. 
I don't have time to take this productive break and think. And I mean, finding time to think, really think, is about one of the hardest things you can do. Ask yourself in the last year, when's the last time you've truly been disconnected? I mean, truly disconnected for a period of 24 hours. No one's talking, not interacting with anyone, staring out a window, sitting by yourself, being alone for a period of one full day. This is normal for some individuals. And in fact, when you look at some of the greatest inventors of all time or scientists like Einstein, he would spend weeks quietly staring out a window and reflecting. And it's through those sorts of elements that you, know, you might think the breakthroughs would happen. Let me put up a poll for everyone. And I'd like you to take a moment, if you could, to, to fill this out. How do you spend your time? How have you been spending your time during the last period of time, uh, this last 16 weeks? What's been your focus? So take a second here, if you could, fill this out, and we'll, we'll try to get um, as many of, we, uh, of you to fill out, and we'll keep track of this, and we'll show the polls here. So if you can get to your computer, I know if some of you may be trying to jump in, but we'll try to get to at least 30 or 40 responses if we can quickly. Just keep going. We have a few more, another 10 seconds or so. Okay, so let's end this here and I'll show you the results. So family, right? So if, if, if you're not gonna be able to get to work, it's family, it's your work. More of you are looking at hobbies, wonderful. You've been focusing on health or fitness. And uh, you know, as normal, a few of us have been also just taking this time to say, you know what, that's okay. It's, it's good to relax and move on. Let me show you what our community has been doing on ortho evidence. So, Similar, right? 70% of our community has said, you no, know, they had an extreme reduction in their normal practice. That led them to either reinvest in family, reinvest in more work, or maybe thinking about catching up with work, hobbies. But the fundamental thing I noticed, which was interesting, is very few people took time to truly just decompress and what we'll use the word relax. And maybe there's a stigma around that. But this to me is probably one of the most important quotes for me in the last 16 weeks. When it comes to accelerating performance, there's a paradox. If you wanna have greater impact faster, you have to slow down enough to reflect. And that was to me is fundamental on what we've done and where we're gonna go. This last 16 weeks has been a forced reflection. And I can tell you, for me, this has been some of the things that I've been trying to do. So I've been writing a lot, but I've been not writing um, papers per se, as much as narrative writing, blog writing, um, and just making notes and thinking and reading. And I've learned in my own way that maybe we need to just slow down and find ways to get quiet. However we do it, five minutes, 10 minutes, we can, all of us can find five or 10 minutes, can't we? I mean, this has been sort of the way I've been looking at this. So this acronym is one I just kind of came up with, um, but you know, you've seen different ones, right? So, you know, I think it's important for me to stop worrying about quiet time as being unproductive time. I think it's okay to be idle because sometimes when you're idle, you get these ideas and then you start reading and you realize, and I think many of you here probably are quite aware that um, Bill Gates, takes these things that he promotes called think weeks. He takes a full week, takes a bag of books and you see the books he has there and he moves right into uh, his little cottage space and just alone with no family, no anybody and just reads um, and reflects. Now we can also argue and say, well, he has the privilege and the resources to be able to do that. Not all of us have that privilege or resource. Completely understand. But maybe the world has told all of us it's time to think. It's time to take a step back and I reflected on that. For me, it became a think month. There was literally everything was shut down. So reading became a big part of it. So I did that. I said, you know what? I'm going to consume as much as I can. I'm going to get to books I haven't read. And I'm going to read things that ultimately are hopefully just going to open my mind up to whatever is next without any preconceived notion of, of learning except for the sake of learning. Now, this gets back to something that I've been struggling with myself. But I'll share with you my story. But I, I'm, I'm curious what you think. Do you know your 20%? And I'd say, of course you do. Now, here's a 60 second exercise I'd like you to take. What you, I want you to take a pen and a pencil, right, just sit down or a pencil and sit down right now for 60 seconds and write down the 20% of the things you do in your life that give you 80% of your joy, the 20, 80 rule. So what are the 20% of the things you do? Handful of things that you do that give you 80% 
of your life's joy. Take a minute here um, and reflect on that, and then I'll walk you through what I'm thinking. And I urge you to take a pencil and paper and actually write it down. Write it down. Or 30 seconds or so. Okay, so I hope you did that. I hope you did that. Now, I'm going to ask, ask you to answer a couple of questions on that experience. Writing my 20% exercise in this exercise was easy or hard? How quickly did you, were you able to put down the 20% of the things that give you 80% of your life's joy? Okay. Not sure of these results. So if you look at this, I hopefully everyone can see this. It's hard. It's not that easy. And for, for the 25% of you that jumped in and said, you know what? It was easy. Good for you. That's great. Cause that means you figured it out. But I also say, take time to really think and, and refine those statements. For those of you, it's somewhat difficult or, uh, or uh, very difficult. Absolutely. It's really hard to do. And that also means that we should be thinking more about this. I'm going to put another question down here if I can. So, We'll, we'll put the second poll question. Okay, there's, an, uh, there's another one here. Next one. <clears throat> it's the next question, actually. Yep, this one. My 20% list was comprised of what? One point, a few things, many things, or too many things? Okay, so we'll, we'll keep this moving along. And you can see here that for most of us, it is just that, right? It's usually a few things. There's usually a few things that we say will drive the majority of our joy. Then you have to ask yourself, am I doing that? So let me walk you through something that happened with me in 2018. This was actually um, uh, after a trip to India where we had attended a course um, with some colleagues, uh, Dr. Sanchetti and his team in India. We had done a course and my colleague and I, uh, Dr. Brad Petrazor, decided, you know what, we'll go ahead and do a quick trip to Nepal uh, and do a trek. So here we are standing January, 2018. Have you ever had this moment where you're at some place and you say to yourself, how is it possible that I am well over half of my life and I've never stood on this and to seen this beauty that our country has to offer? And you say, there's gotta, something's gotta change. You cannot live your life in a way that you live in spurts where you have a, a day or two here and then you try to rush and try to find all the ways to decompress, to only go back into a pressure cooker again. And it became very evident to me, very, very evident to me that around that time we were in this moment where I thought, this is it. This is the time it happened. I said, I am tired of just working and working and working and thinking that more work will get you better. Yeah, work, you have to work to a point um, but doing more of the same is not going to give you different results. You've got to figure out the stuff that gives you the additional skill. And there were so many things in my youth that I just gave up that I thought these were complementary skills and surely they could help me. I, we all have it. You all have it, right? So what are those 20% of the things that you have not spent the focus on that you could refocus? And I said, I'm going to do it. And in fact, it was around that time that I wrote this. And in fact, I signed it and I dated it because I wanted to remember that this was something that I felt was important and I put it in pen and ink. And that's why I re requested all of you do the same. You write something down. You say, what's your 20%? For me, it was meaningful connections, families, friendships, colleagues, um, you know, uh, whether 
know it's any of those things, right? That was very, very important to me. Some degree of a micro expedition, getting out somewhere, just getting out, experiencing the world was very important to me. Um, finding something in the arts. For me, I'll share with you a little bit about what it is for me, but I, I think we all have some other aspiration that we can explore, whatever that may be. And I love hearing people's stories. And I also like to start telling stories. And I'm going to work on this. I'm going to tell more stories. I love using research as a tool, but research when done in its most elegant way is a beautiful story. So how do we start telling stories? And obviously, as you know, for all of us, there's an element of our work, which is evidence and data and decisions. But for me, it was fundamental. And I continually looked at this and I reevaluated every single year and say, is what I'm doing consistent with my 20%? So remember that first statement that I put out, the very first line, which was the five and said, follow your passion and you know, make sure you have a, a good uh, investment in a, in, a, in a good network and all these sorts of things. Well, I, re I revised it. I said, you know, actually maybe it's this, maybe this is what I'm gonna now focus on. Maybe it's got about, taking time to think and really try new things. And I'm, I think for me, trying new things means I've got to become more creative. I've got to develop it. I've got to go back to the things as a child that allowed me to be free in my thought. And maybe that will actually make me better at my life and my work. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to try to, passion is about fun. And when, when you love something, you actually really, really have fun. I'm going to do what we just did, the annex says. I'm going to invest in that 20% and I'm going to make sure that I revise that document every single year to make sure I'm not, you know, changing, I'm, I'm not changing my mindset. And also you've got to figure out failure. I, I know many of us don't like it. And I think our children, uh, for those who always have children or uh, are seeing that the youth right now are afraid of failing. Um, and if you're in that youth category right now, you ask yourself, why is it that I feel the pressure to always win and never take the risk of failing? That in itself is a risk reward issue we have to sort out. And for me on a personal level, it's totally okay to start again. And so that thing for me is very important. So take a look at this, Quentin Tarantino, take it or leave it if you like him as a, as a writer or producer, but he has said from day one, I have 10 major movies I will do and then I will do no more. That's it, 10 major movies and I will do no more. Now, what would you do if you just had one more movie in your in your life story? What if you, if you had one more paper you're gonna write? What if it, you just had one more event, one more year of your career? How would you spend that time? He's in the peak of his career. There's no reason why he should be retiring from movies, but he's made that for himself in a way that says, I believe that I can do great things in this small period of time. And then you know what? I'll start again. I'll reinvent myself is what he's been saying. So it's very, very powerful to think about that. So that got me thinking, okay, on a personal note, I've got to do something. I want to start creating. I want to figure out this new future that's, that's going to happen. And I said, okay, well, let's look at other creative people. The people say, quote, genius. All of you know, friends, you all know this. We overuse that term genius. Genius is an extremely, extremely rare group of individuals. And most of us have never seen a genius or interacted with a genius, quite frankly. But these are individuals that who we perceive as genius are people who have had luck and a lot of hidden advantages. There's some people who are just wired for higher risks, right? They take higher risks, they get higher rewards. Some people look at it as life as, well, work isn't the reward. It's actually, I mean, so work itself is a reward. It's no, not the outcome. So climbers, for example, some of these elite rock climbers say, I climb for the sake of climbing. What do you mean? You don't want to get to the top? No, I just climb for the sake of climbing. But there is this rare, 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 extraordinary human that one might attribute the word genius to, but the majority are not that type of individual. And the question you ask yourself is, how much are you willing to risk on your idea? You know, I remember hearing this biography of Alfred Hitchcock, of all people, who said he went near bankrupt to put out Psycho. No one wanted Psycho, that movie, ended up being the biggest gamble of his life, in the biggest win of his life. But he believed so strongly in his idea. He had a very, very, very um, low tolerance or high tolerance to risk. He could take on risk. Um, he mortgaged his house. You know, back then in the time that he was building Psycho, it was an $800,000 that he had to put out. And so um, he put it all out there. He says, if, if we are either all in or all out, and that's a question that you have to ask yourself. 
He had a belief, but most of us, most of us are taking it very safe. And maybe most of us has lost 98% of our creativity. You know, we're in a, we're in a world now where we're just not creative in the same way we should be. And then we're in a place where everyone tells us this is the most creative time that you, that you should ever be in, right? You should be in the time that's the most creative. I would put forth that most of us, three and four of us right now on this call, on this, on this video that we're doing today, probably feel we're not living up to our own creative potential. And you can't say, well, listen, I've got lots of ideas. Well, yeah, great. That means you're very imaginative. Have you ever acted on one of your ideas? I mean, seriously acted. Well, if you haven't, you're not creative. The thing I've learned from my own problems, my own issues has been, I was very imaginative. I had all kinds of ideas, but then you can't go and say, oh, that was my idea. I should have done that. Well, you didn't do it. So therefore, don't get upset with someone who actually acted on that idea. You know, there are many people in this room I know right now who are listening and watching who are people I actually look up to. Many of you I look up to because I know what you've done and you are creative to me. But saying isn't doing. You actually have to do something, right? This is interesting. I mean, and if you know Canadian, uh, there's a band Rush and probably the best drummer of all drummers, Neil Peart, passed away this year. It was early in February, I believe. And uh, it's been a shockwave to those who were appreciative of this, you know, absolute, absolute phenoms ability. But look what they said about him. His, the lead singer of this band said to about Neil Peart, he said, you're the only guy I know who rehearses before a rehearsal. And that's what it is to become the absolute best. You can't just talk about stuff. You have to do it. When you talk about people like Richard Feynman in physics, you know, you read about these characters and they say, you know, these are the kind of people that had a diversity of interest. We get so narrow and say, you must become a super specialized individual, super specialized. You're going to come and you're going to learn everything about one area. Maybe that's true. But the interesting thing in this study that followed 40 high potential scientists, all of whom could have gone on to win a Nobel Prize, but they all didn't. Only seven or eight of them did. And what made the seven or eight get the Nobel Prize? was where they got this information out and saying, well, how do these people, well, how do they differ from the people who are already high potential? They had a diversity of interest. They weren't actually anywhere near as focused as you would have thought they were. They were people that were out all the time doing other things. In fact, they had found that successful scientists, and remember, this could be a successful scientist, could be a successful surgeon, could be a successful physiotherapist, could be a successful entrepreneur, whoever it is in areas those individuals that have highly integrated networks of enterprise and their less successful colleagues tend to have fewer non-scientific activities. So you've got to get out of your own way sometimes in your own work to move on. So that gets back to that 20%. I said, my, this all makes sense to me. So here in, you know, in January of 2018, I'm thinking, I feel I should be doing the things I used to love to do. And hopefully that'll make me better at what I do. Then you get data out there that says, we know this, look, it's been published. I mean, there has been follow-up studies on these people that says just that. Nobel Prize winning scientists are two and a half, more than two and a half times more likely than the average scientist to have an artistic hobby. I said, oh, I can't believe this. And I used to thwart all my hobbies thinking, oh, it's just about work. I got to do more papers. I got more writing. That's my hobby. My work is my life now. And then you hear like, you know, individuals at MIT um, in the U.S. saying, no, 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 no. We have to teach our scientists to emphasize on curiosity. And quite frankly, the liberal arts have an emphasis on nurturing curiosity and developing strong writers and go on to reward rigorous examination of difficult problems. So these individuals say, when we know someone has come in from a liberal arts background or has that bent, we already know we can shape them into a good scientist because they already have the curiosity they need. Look at these individuals now. I'm gonna walk you through a few people, right? So this individual, theoretical chem chemist, Nobel Prize, 1981, I write poetry to penetrate the world around me, to comprehend my reactions to it. The language of science is inherently poetic. And in fact, he writes, building a career in poetry is way harder than in science. In the best chemical journal in the world, the acceptance rate for a full article is about 35%. In a routine literary journal, far from the best, the acceptance rate for a poem is below 5%. So in getting their craft, they are learning to think a little bit more tangentially. When you think about these, these individuals, individuals like Einstein, what did Einstein love? He was absolutely brilliant, but what did he love to do? If you're thinking, 
Violin, you're absolutely correct, right? He did many other things, but if you're thinking violin, you're absolutely correct. How about this one? Two, 2014 Nobel laureate, May Britt Moser. What, what was she as a child encouraged and allowed to do? She would stare at snails for hours and hours and hours. And if you look at that, you think, how can that lead to something? And the point is, it's just an innate curiosity. When is the last time? When I saw this, it just shook me. Because when's the last time I've literally just watched an ant walking across or stared at something and been immersed in the moment um, so much that everything around you is gone? I mean, if you fully, truly surrender to that moment, it can feel like a lifetime. You know, we had a discussion the other night talking about how do you communicate with patients? And they said, you know, we don't have time. You know, how do we make a patient feel that we're connected? And, you know, having read all this and feeling this, I say, you know, if you spend 15 seconds, 30 seconds, one minute truly engaged in that moment, it will feel like an hour. It'll feel like two hours to the individual you're talking to because we are so distracted um, that it's impossible. It's impossible for us to be able to uh, do that in this day and age. How about this fellow? 1990 Nobel laureate in economics. Well, he was an avid comic book reader with a special interest in this particular comic. Everyone has something they like to do that is part of their 20%. And in fact, Nobel laureates in general, I've used this as an example, not to say that here we are all aspiring to be Nobel laureates, but I think it gives a little bit of context because there's been so much research done in this group as being this outlier group. And you realize we all have these tendencies. We all have the tendency to like things other than our day-to-day -day work, yet we tend to minimize those tendencies thinking more work is better. But what about that idea of having integrated activities? So if you're, this gentleman here is the most elite climber in the world, by far the climber's climber. You ask 10 climbers who's the best climber, they say Adam Andra. And what does Ad Andra do? You can imagine what he does. He finds something that will help him gain better flexibility, better strengthening. So he is an avid practitioner of ballet. And he says, this is a good complementary skill set that I can use to, to, to better myself. Think of all the complementary skill sets that you can be doing um, to improve your own life and, and the things you do. So here's what it gets back to, folks. If you want to become creative, we've got to do all these things. And I said, okay, well, I've got to start building this storyline. And this person says it much better than I could. So I'm just borrowing the words of Mary Lou Cook that creates all of these things, which really became part of my own mindset in the last little while. So much part of my mindset that at our orthopedic division meeting, we actually focused on creativity uh, as our number one focus for a discussion um, and trying to get people to understand in our group that we are more than just our day-to-day -day life. Uh, and more importantly, that emphasis on you can work hard, you can work on that 80%, and we should work on that 80% to have a good life. But more of the same will not get you to a great or an exceptional life. And I've said this to many, many friends, and I've heard this back from many of you, and I know some of you are listening in right now, we've had these conversations privately, and I'm just reflecting on those conversations. Because ultimately, if you're gonna have an impact, you've got to move to something else. So, so for me, it's been about this whole movement of creative thinking and how do you get there and what are the tactics you can use and how do we move forward? All scientists, and I, when I say the word scientists, think of yourself in your own career, right? Whatever that may be. In this case, likely orthopedics, but something in musculoskeletal health, let's say. We all realize that our work is only a small part of our total ability, right? This is what we believe. So, we can tell stories with all kinds of things. When people think of the late Anthony Bourdain, I think they think of him more as a storyteller than a foodie. When they think of a great comedian, whoever that may be, he or she is a great storyteller more than they are about telling jokes. They're telling stories. And sometimes, as Monet said, you don't even have to tell a story. You don't have to say a word. You can paint that picture. You can tell the world without saying a single word what your story is. And that's how you can completely revolutionize the way you think. For me, it became about, oh, early on, randomized trials. I'm gonna tell stories with data. That was my own brand. I'm gonna push and I'm gonna to try to tell, we all have our own brand and you have to know what your brand is. And then I got to the point of saying, you know, I just keep presenting papers with research and P-values and confidence intervals. 
maybe there's a way to say, well, can you master numbers in a way that you're no longer just reading numbers, but you're reading meanings? And that gets me back to even trying to be more reflective of why numbers come into your life, why the number five is so strong, and why these things are so powerful. And I've learned from many. And I started off with this individual, Professor Gordon Guide. We had a session last night. And once again, he was educating us on numbers and data and making rational decisions. But ultimately, he says, you got to think big. You got to think really, really big. It's an abstract term, friends. Two words, think big, can mean anything. It can be simple or it can be very, very complex. But here's the point. As all of you sit back and say to yourself, how do you want to spend the next five years, the next year? For me, this, has been the, this quote has been very powerful to me. And this is a quote that I, just was, I was watching a documentary on Ed Witten, who I think right now is probably the greatest living, um, uh, uh, astro, uh, greatest living particle physicist, or in this case, uh, string theory and M-theory fame. But he, he says in one of his in interviews, you know, it's one of these YouTube videos, you dig up and you see it and you think, oh, and then he says something. He says, you know, the hardest part of research, and I perked up and I said, well, yeah, I, I'd like to know what he thinks. He says, you want to have a question that's big enough worth answering. And I said, yeah, that's all of us. We want to figure out whatever we're going to do, whether it's your career, whether it's your path, you want to have something you feel is big enough, a big enough challenge, it's worth spending your energy and time to learn how to do. But then here's the crux of it. Here's the crux of it. He says then, but actually small enough, you can answer it. That's where we all go wrong. We set our sights so high into point like, I will be involved in global warming and I will save the, the earth. And then you realize that by simply posting something on Instagram that I'm concerned about global warming is not doing anything except virtue signaling to the world that I'm interested in global warming. It's not doing anything. Social media has made it very easy for us to signal what we think is a virtue without actually ever having to do anything about it. So it's much easier to say, let's set my goal to something I can actually accomplish and then do it and actually do it. So I said to myself, okay, I've got to find a way to get ideas. Now, let me ask you this. I'm, I'm going to put up a poll here, friends. Where do you go to get your best ideas? Where do you get your best ideas in life? When you're out there alone, when you're with a group, We'll put up a little poll here, and I'd love to see where, where, where all you are getting your ideas from. We all have these big breakthrough things. Where do they come from? I'm gonna wait another second or two, just get a few more people to jump in. Okay, so let's end polling right now just so we can keep people moving along. And isn't that so true, right? Don't, we, don't the majority of us get our ideas alone? Don't the majority of us feel that we're either alone or with an activity? No, I'm not saying that there's uh, not a situation where we're not going to find great ideas with other people, but the majority of us do seven to find times alone. I was, I was in that mindset myself. I thought, you know, there's probably places we can go alone. And when we actually surveyed our, 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 our membership at Ortho Evidence, look at this, 75% of our members have said that they have had their best ideas when they're doing something solitary, whatever that may be. And then 76% say they actually, that they actually look for new ideas by finding a quiet spot. So I can't think unless I'm alone. I've got to get away from distraction. So we are seeking this out. And the truth is, when you look at other people, you know, it's hours of uninterrupted thinking. I'm a serial wanderer. Uh, I take a think week, and we've heard about all this, right? It doesn't take a lot. Yeah, we, maybe you can't take a week, and I know I couldn't take a week, but maybe you can take an hour. I made it try to make it part of my day. Sometimes you're in the shower and you have an idea. And, and, and there's evidence to say that that is really where we do get a lot of ideas. Why? Because you're just for the one place you can't have your phone. You're not going to have any distractions, hopefully. And you're just going to be focusing and you get into your thoughts, right? And I'm sure there's many of you who have probably stayed in the shower a bit longer than you normally would because you're just enjoying that moment of just being alone. Um, you know, and water itself helps you with that. But 72% of us, so that's three and four of us, have experienced a new idea. Here I am again. So this is back to February. I'm with my very, very close colleague and alumni at McMaster, Professor Edmundo Baruman. And we were on a bike ride and we were chatting and we were having fun. And all this was before, you know, before I knew that I would never be traveling again for the next part of the year. But I never used to do this before. I now do, whether it's you're walking or you're talking, you're trying to get out and interact with people as much as you possibly can. Have, have any of you tried this before? And I did this. 
contact three other people from your university or your hospital that you've never met before. Send them an email and say, hi, I'm so-and-so. I was wondering if I could take you out for breakfast. What do you think they're going to say? Well, this group of people said, oh, okay, uh, what's the agenda? Um, what is this about? I said, no agenda, I'd like to take you for breakfast. Really? Oh, okay. Um, well, okay, what's the purpose? What, what can I help you with? I said, nothing really, just want to meet you. And there was this awkward back and forth. Finally, I got them in the room. The first 30 seconds to a minute was everyone just wondering why we're here. And remember, I had no idea who they were. Like, I mean, I, I didn't know. There was one individual I knew, but the other two, I had, I had never met them. It was the first time I'm meeting them, actually, just on email. And they didn't, they'd never met me. Looking at this photograph, friends, would you think that we didn't know each other? This was 15 minutes into our discussion. And by the way, these strangers became very, very close. And I still relate to many of them. We, we interact all the time. How many times have you found that you've just not connected with people right around you who have such a great diversity of interest? So this was a health economist. This was a dean of nursing. This was a, a neuroscientist with an interest in music. And we all came together with very, very parallel ideas. The other thing I've done is I've just given up my office. I, I have meetings now out. So if I'm, if I, it forces me to have a meeting with somebody outside, whether we meet with, this is our, our, our core research group in terms of our leadership and we meet and we walk um, this is one example. We've aptly called it the virtual office. And yes, yes, friends, while I've been very, very grateful that, you know, we've had um, lots and lots of um, uh, publications that we hope have impacted our field to some degree. But can I tell you the paper that I'm most proud of? And, you know, looking at the fact that our last two or three papers have been Lancet, New England Journal, New England Journal, you think, oh, that it should be those ones. Actually, no, it's this paper. It's a paper where I got to talk about a hobby of mine that I love in a mountain bike buyer's guide, which I know has a much bigger circulation than any New England Journal of Medicine uh, circulation would have. For me, that was awesome because it was something that was a hobby that I could finally do something that I like to do is write about. Something else I did what I would have never done before, friends, which is go behind the scenes of a restaurant and say, can I just spend a shift with you? I know it's, uh, th and this was, I was in London, UK. And there's a restaurant, and says, you know, and this is a, a second cousin of mine said, hey, listen, just come. Well, you know, you'll sit outside. We'll, we'll, we'll feed you. It's a gastronomic experience. I said, no, no, no. It's okay. Can I just come in the back and watch what you do? And within an hour, he said, oh, well, you've seen enough. Try one of these. And what I saw from him um, is this whole way of rethinking art and rethinking um, how someone leads a massive group and how someone is creative. And I said, okay, I'm going to go back and I'm going to start art again. So after probably 20 years, I said, I'm going to start painting again. This is the, fir this is the first or second page of my, of my sketchbook that I started about, would have been 2018, 19, 2019, about a year ago. From that, with just daily practice and getting just, just working on it again and trying to get, find my way, I went from that to about that in about six months. And I started painting again. And then I go back to that point where I thought, okay, I still feel like I'm copying art. Like, I don't feel like I'm putting my, I don't feel good uh, about what I'm doing. Then this is just an example. All these little specks you're seeing here, that was watching that chef throw spices on a plate and thinking it's beautiful, it's art. You are just throwing spices. So I said, it's like a salad. And I started using that because I learned that. And then I thought, you know, at the end of the day, one of my core goals in life is to become a better storyteller. And I thought, well, you know, without a story, it's just a picture. And I felt like I was just painting pictures and I wasn't telling stories. So I worked at it again. And so recently, and you can see January, January, um, and these two are very recent. I've just been working on more, putting more feeling into it. So you, you might break rules, but I don't care if I break rules, but you're putting feeling into it. And all I'm saying to you, uh, friends, is whatever hobby you used to have and you've not done it, Think about it because wherever you are, um, you can probably advance yourself and find ways to improve. And I think the point is you'll say, ah, you know, I can do it later. I've got time. I know there's people on this line who know that that's a trap to think you have time. Wherever you think you are, young or old, right? You have to, re you have to reflect, right? You have to reflect on what you think things are going. So you have to say, okay, everything going forward is opportunity and if I don't do something and I get, keep going year by year, I look backwards with regret and saying, oh, I should have done it. 
you can choose how you do it uh, and you can totally choose, you know, what, what this all means to you. But I can tell you, I can tell you on a personal note, this is what we get stuck with the cognitive dissonances, which is I have time. It'll be fine. You know, the cognitive disson uh, dissonance I had in February in Mexico thinking, ah, you know, I'll be traveling. I have no problem. And then not knowing because I knew there was something going on, but I didn't know it was going to affect me. Oh, you know, other people have a problem. It won't affect me. Well, it affected all of us. So you've got to act. So I would put forth that at any point in time, you have to be having a model that is regret minimization. What can you do to limit tomorrow's regret? That's the model I've been actually pretty integrally thinking about in my own life. And I've, so I've thrown away the concept. You know, people always ask you, well, and I know many of you here are also in leadership roles. What's your five-year plan? Did anyone know um, if you could put a five-year plan out in January, it would have been useless to you, right? I think we have to think about, you know, daily plans and what are we going to do? So people say, and I had another colleague yesterday in one of my talks, in the first version of this talk, they said to me, they said, well, you know, you should work really hard for three months and then you take your one week off and that's your reward. That's no way to live your life, friends. You know, a vacation every three months for a week. That's no way to live your life. So I said, no, that, that, that's not going to work for me. I'm going to find ways to integrate daily things I like to do, but it's got to start with something really, really, really important to me which is a vision statement. Now it sounds crazy. Maybe to some of you think vision statement, why? You need a personal vision statement. And I've been working on one now for three or four years and it is 50 words or less. So imagine encapsulating who you are and what you mean and what your passions are in 50 words or less. Now do what I just did because you know, it just, I, I've just updated mine. You can see June 14th is when this has been updated. Handwrite it. I went through the painstaking thing of handwriting it in ink using an old ink fountain pen where I had to dip ink so I could go through every word and think about it. I went to the effort of taking wax, melting it and stamping it and dating it. And I will look at this again in six more months. And it's not really matters. It matters not what I said. And this is not about sharing you with my vision because my vision statement is for me. It's a private thing for me. I encourage you all to do the same and to do it. Think of all the fives, right? The five letter word quiet. Think of think in my mind, which is I need time to do this. I've got to figure this out. I've got to, I've got to use that uh, analogy, right? To know it's okay. I've got to use, I've got to find my voice. And I think that is about writing. You've got to write, 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 and hand write things. And ultimately you've got to engage a team, another five letter word uh, around you. So you've got to figure these out. And so for me, it's been about quiet. Once you have that, well, once you clear your mind, you can actually do the other things and start thinking about what's, what matters to you. You can think it's okay. You can figure out what the future is going to hold, however you're going to do that. Then you can start writing it down. And I don't think in an age of technology where typing is the way to go, I think handwriting has been forgotten. And I think you're far better to imprint something if you handwrite it. I was actually last night, we're in a very early morning and I remember a, a longtime colleague and uh, it was really nice to see him. Um, had joined, uh, Damien Griffin had joined. I don't know if he's on today, but he had joined and we were chatting and I, a couple of times uh, I saw him actually bend over and I saw what, him writing and I said, good for him. He's writing. You, you, you don't, you imprint things by writing. And, and I do that now. Like all I do is I have a pen and a paper beside me and I write. And then what you do at the end of it is you go around and you say to yourself for coach, that, that's five, five people. You're the average of the five people around you. So you've got to find people around you who are creative, who have opposing views, who tell you like it is, because sometimes you don't want to hear it, but they got to tell you like it is. They hopefully can motivate you and they help you. They're really helping you. People often take constructive criticism from their mentors or their colleagues as, oh, well, I'm not going to go to them because all they think of, they're just negative people. If someone has the courage to tell you something that no one else is willing to tell you, you should embrace that because 99% of the time, people who don't care about you will let you just flounder and sink. They don't care. They're not putting enough energy or effort to even worry about what's happening with you. If someone has the time to say, I'm concerned, you need to shift your gears. Take that as a gift. Take it as a gift. And I, I trust me, take that as a gift. Um, people pay attention to those they really want to do well, but write and write and write. So this goes back to the very first uh, Quentin Tarantino um, book that he, uh, movie he wrote, which was, uh, as you, know, you may know, have heard of something called Pulp Fiction. It took him eight, two to eight years of working on that. Look at his desk. It's binders and binders of handwritten notes. He still handwrites his scripts and then he starts typing. There's a power to writing. 
there's a power to writing. And let me finish off here with a few other concepts. So I, I, I didn't have this slide in yesterday when I did it, but I've been thinking deeply about this issue. When you think about yourself, there are two types of people. On the bottom graph, there's that group, and I'm, I'm just generalizing what happens in North America. Every three months, we do a trip to the Caribbean, we do a week off, and we go right back to our work. Then another three months, we go right back to the Caribbean, we go back. That is their creativity heat map. That is the, that's the world as they see it. Then there's other individuals who have, who have a different heat map. Let me ask you this. When you take away where you've been around the world, the bigger your global footprint is, the greater you'll have a diversity of ideas. It is so obvious to know and interact with people who have never left their city or their town or their country versus those that have communicated around the world. When you do that, you just get better. You get more creative. You get more inspired. You get more action-oriented because you're surrounding yourself by this. The whole purpose of why we're doing this, this session, not this particularly, but this whole OE World Tour has been to engage all of us from all parts of the world so we can actually do something and learn from each other and realize there's all kinds of things that are, are ahead of us. So ask yourself, are you meeting your potential? I said to myself, I don't think I am. I can do more. And every year I say, I think I can do more. What can I do? Well, I got to figure out time. Biggest thing is prioritizing time. The fact that you have all spent an hour listening to me uh, already just you know, warms me to think, wow, like that's really great because we're going to have a discussion after this right? and we'll do more. And I put I, forth- I jumped like five feet. Yeah, right. So we should, so, so we should actually be talking about this sort of things, right? We should actually be thinking about what we're going to do going forward. Um, and the homework I have for you, the homework I have for you is the following, right? Is this draft your vision statement, draft your vision statement as soon as you possibly can, right? That's what you want to be doing. Thank you very much.